when I moved to Toledo, uh, I was coming from Cleveland, and I had a number of people in the church who told me that, uh, what was I doing going to such an unimportant place? Uh, that, that real greatness meant going to a great place. This is not true. What is true is following God's will. And even if it's in Spartanburg or Toledo or Bloomington or some other small town that the elites who walk past Joshua Bell don't care about, that doesn't mean that this covenant doesn't apply. Welcome to the Basic Training Podcast, led by Dr. Robert Forney. In this series, we'll be discussing the topic of manhood in today's society. I got a story I'd like to tell you, um, and it's about the subject is perception. Um, one of the things that is characteristic of a godly man is awareness. Perceiving things um, of the Lord and perceiving things uh, of his family and his church and around him. And so one morning, a young man in jeans and a baseball cap stood in a Washington, D.C. subway station against a wall. From a small case, he pulls out a violin and then opens the case at his feet for contributions. He then began to play classical masterpieces that have endured centuries on their brilliance alone, soaring music befitting the grandeur of cathedrals and concert halls. His instrument was his own 1713 Stradivarius, crafted during the Italian master's golden period. It is said that the violin is an instrument much like the human voice. Um, is that right, Andrew? Uh, it can be played that way. Okay. Is that the way you play it? No. <laughs> okay. In this particular young man's hands, uh, it sang. Uh, it was uh, sorrowful, adoring, flirtatious, romancing, merry, triumphal, sumptuous music. The first piece he picked was a piece that was written by Johann Sebastian Bach uh, after his wife died. Um, he was in mourning. Uh, you, may, you fellows may know uh, Bach was a, a Christian man who wrote a lot of music for the church. Anyway, uh, this is a solo violin piece, um, and it's come to be known as not just one of the great, greatest pieces of music ever written, but one of the greatest achievements of any man in history. Uh, Brahms was blown away by it. Uh, it's a spiritually powerful piece, emotionally powerful, structurally perfect, uh, and it is also very long and entirely challenging. Um, it's called, if I can pronounce it right, Shakon, 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 I think, or Shakon. Uh, no. During that time, it was rush hour, and there were over a thousand people went through the station. Most of them were highly educated federal bureaucrats on their way to work. The station, L'Enfant Plaza, is at the nucleus of federal Washington. Of the thousand or so that went through, only seven paused. Uh, $32 was all that was dropped into the violin case. Most of these deep state elites did not know that the violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the greatest in the world. He played one of the most intricate and beautiful pieces ever written with a violin worth $3.5 million. Three days before his plane in the subway, Bell sold out a concert in Boston, the seats averaging $100 apiece. Today, few have the ability to perceive what is important in the world around them, and most suffer from a loss of the appreciation of beauty. This is not because people don't have the capacity to perceive or understand, but it's because it's irrelevant. Um, this is especially true with the advent of smartphones and social media, 
where people are focused on their own communications and are meanwhile unaware of what's going on around them. So tonight I want us to look at uh, the covenant of the Lord. And I want to tell you, um, in the church in America, I don't know that there are many men that have ever considered the covenant of the Lord. The covenant of the Lord is a promise. It's a contract. And um, it's something that we ought to be very familiar with. And like last week with creation, this is sort of foundational to everything that we're going to talk about in terms of manhood. In Jeremiah 5, one of the one of the judgments on unbelieving and idol-worshiping Israel uh, was this. Uh, now hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble in my presence? For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. So one of the signs of our secular age, I believe, is the fact that so many men have eyes but don't see and have ears but don't hear, and especially when it comes to spiritual matters. Well, let's, uh, let's begin with prayer and... Uh, I'd ask one of you, uh, would you open us in prayer? Present. Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have together to meet as men. We thank you for Dr. Forney and his giving of his time. Lord, we pray that your spirit would humble our hearts before your word and mm -hmm. that we might leave differently than we came. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 So uh, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to start. Uh, we're going to start there. And before we do, I want to give you a uh, Webster's New World Dictionary definition of the word covenant. It has a Latin origin, convenir, which means coming together, um, and uh, it means two or more coming together. Uh, typically to make a contract, to agree on promises, stipulations, privileges, and responsibilities. A second word that I want to define, uh, this is going to be the Abrahamic covenant. And so Abram, which was his name before um, God changed it, uh, Abram means exalted father. Uh, Abraham, after the change was made, means father of a multitude. Um, in chapter 15 of Genesis, uh, Abraham believed God and he reckoned that to him as righteousness. This is a famous uh, quote in the New Testament. Um, so I'm going to begin at verse 31 in chapter 11. Um, now Terah, that was Abram's son, uh, Abram's father, Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldees in order to enter the land of Canaan, and they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now when we finish this passage, we're going to look uh, at Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, and we find right here at the beginning a very interesting thing. It says that Terah, the father, took his son Abram and Lot, the son of Haran, uh, and uh, others, his, um, Abram's wife and his grandson and so forth, that it was a Terah action. But in Acts 7, we find that it was Abram received a call in Haran, not now, I'm sorry, in, um, in Ur of the Chaldees and uh, not in Haran. Reading this passage, that Terah took Abram his son, it's, it's like the call came to Terah and uh, that Terah went as far as Haran. Um, 
I put a map on the um, on your handout, which you'll you'll get at the end here. And uh, if you can imagine the crescent, uh, you're familiar with the Tigris and Euphrates where they come together, and Ur is down at the bottom, and then um, Haran is up at the top of the crescent, and uh, Canaan, the Promised Land, is uh, to the west and down south again. So it's a big, uh, a big semicircle trip, and so there, uh, Terra makes it halfway and stops. So an interesting thing about this all is I want you to think about the relationship between a father and a son, and um, what exactly that ra that relationship is. So now uh, back to the passage. We're now at chapter twelve, <coughs> and. Um, this is how it, it starts. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed." So, um, so the Lord is saying to Abram, and apparently this was, as, as Stephen will tell us, is in Ur of the Chaldees. And he says, wh what does he say? He, he gives him something to do, and then he tells him what he's going to do. So God gives us things to do, but he also tells us what he will do. And so a man's perception and understanding of his own life and of God's will is really based on these two things. And so what is Abram to do? Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you. So go forth from and go to. Uh, God's call is will be from something and to something. Many men will go forth without going towards. They're running away. They're escaping something, but they're not going to where God's will is. And, uh, and this is wrong. And so then what will God do? Well, there are a series of I wills. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. So God will make, make you a great nation, who will bless you and make your name great. Guys, godliness, as we are godly, God will make us great. He will make our name great, and he will bless us. And there's a reason why he does this. The reason is he wants to be glorified. And God is great. And God has a great name. Uh, and God is blessing itself. And so he wants us, he wants each one of you to have these same attributes. And this promise based on this obedience, is this covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is that Abram is to obey and God is to do the work. Abram's he has something to do, to move, uh, but it is God who is going to make him. And it seems counterintuitive because he's going someplace that is not great. In fact, it's full of evil. Um, and he's going off by himself. He's leaving stuff. And how is it that his name can be great if he's not known? Uh, I had When I moved to Toledo, um, I was coming from Cleveland, and I had a number of people in the church who told me that, uh, what was I doing going to such an unimportant place? Uh, that, that real greatness meant going to a great place. This is not true. What is true is following God's will. And even if it's in Spartanburg or Toledo or Bloomington 
or some other small town that the elites who walk past Joshua Bell um, don't care about, uh, that doesn't mean that this covenant doesn't apply. And then God asked, uh, God says what the result is, and the result is, and so you will be, you shall be a blessing. So the result of God's work and Abram's obedience is not just for Abram, but for others. That that greatness ends up meaning that we are a blessing to others. And then God adds this promise, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, and indeed, this has come to pass. Um, this is uh, a preacher in Philadelphia uh, some time ago uh, named Donald Gray Barnhouse said this about this passage. He said, when the Greeks overran Palestine and desecrated the altar in the Jewish temple, they were soon conquered by Rome. When Rome killed Paul and many others and destroyed Jerusalem under Titus, Rome soon fell. Spain was reduced to a fifth-rate nation after the Inquisition against the Jews. Poland fell after the pogroms. Hitler's Germany went down after its orgies of anti-Semitism. Brit Britain lost her empire when she bro broke her faith with Israel. So this, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Let me tell you, bless God's people. Bless God's people. Do not curse God's people. The one who curses you, I will curse. I have seen in my life so many people who thought so little of the church and of God's people that they freely and easily spoke all manner of evil about them behind their back and did other things to, uh, to harm those who are the Lord's. Don't do this. This angers God. He wants us to be a blessing. He doesn't want us to be judge of people who are beloved by him. And so the result of this in verse 4, So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they acquired in Haran and set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And so Abram believed God. Now let's consider Stephen's treatment of this uh, powerful and foundational covenant um, that is not just Abram, but it's to all of his generations, of which we, the church, are counted in, the, in those generations. So Stephen was being taken, he's going to be stoned, and he's giving his defense in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. And the high priest asks him if these things are so, what he had been doing. And this is Stephen's answer. Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abram, Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. So notice when he was in Mesopotamia, that would make it Ur of the Chaldees before he lived in Haran and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Stephen condenses the, the uh, covenant. And he goes on, he says, Then he, that is Abraham, left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. So think, what is, it, what is it Stephen is saying? He's taking his fellow Jews back to the, this foundational covenant, and he's saying that Abraham did his part. He left. He came to the very country where, where you're at. 
But then Stephen says, but he gave him no inheritance, not even a foot of ground. Well, wait a minute. God had promised that inheritance. And so Stephen is, is working in eternity, and those around him are not. And he's trying to help them understand God and God's covenant. He, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. I'm, I'm reading again from Stephen's um, defense. But God spoke to this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge. And God said, after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And so God not only gave Abraham a covenant and a promise, but he also foretold the captivity, the captivity that the Jews in Stephen's day still remembered. Um, as our nation remembers slavery, they remembered being slaves uh, in Babylon. And, uh, but God had promised not only because of their dis that they would disobey and that he would take them into captivity, but he also promised that he would bring them out and that after they came out, they would serve him in this place, meaning in Jerusalem. It's interesting, the word serve is the same word as worship. And so uh, worship is really an act of service, and service is an act of worship. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. And so what Stephen's saying is these things that God promised have come to pass and are continuing to come to pass. And so the things in my life and in your life, they will come to pass. My grandfather, um, Grandfather Forney, was a school teacher, and uh, he also was a poet. He loved the Lord. He served in his church. He taught Bible studies uh, for young people in his church, young married people in his church. And uh, near the end of his life, my dad asked him to write a biography. And the, t the title that my grandfather gave to his biography was these things too came to pass. And he described all the desires that he had had as a child and all the things he longed for and all the things he was frustrated by, all the, the deviations from the, these things being fulfilled. And yet, one by one, these things came to pass. And they came to pass because my grandfather served the Lord, loved his people, and was walked humbly. And so I say to you as young men, do you perceive what God is doing? So many people today are metaphorically looking at their shoes. They can only see the next minute in front of them, and they can't see back generations or forward generations. And, uh, and this makes them very poor at perceiving what God is doing and uh, understanding uh, their place. So what, what are some of the lessons we can learn from this covenant as put forth in the book of Genesis and as uh, referred to at the beginning of Stephen's uh, defense? Well, I think the first um, thing we learn is about fathers and sons. Um, Stephen says, our father Abraham, and he's applying that the promises to the father are promises to the children as well. And so if we understand God, we understand that what God promised my grandfather, indeed what God promised Abraham, are promises to me and my children as well. The second thing I think we can learn, there's many things we can learn in here, but secondly, uh, before he lived in Haran was when this call came. So 
and, and when Stephen says, uh, and he got there and he didn't receive an inheritance, even one foot in it, Abram bought his a, a piece of land for him to be buried in when, when Sarah died. Uh, but that's all that Abraham ever owned, and it wasn't an inheritance. It was something that he actually purchased. Um, so the idea that this starts in Ur of the Chaldees, and yet Abraham gets to Haran and is not yet to, um, to the Promised Land, probably because Terah wanted to stop, and he's honoring his father, Terah, um, and then when Terah dies, then he goes on to the promised land. We have to understand that God's promises and his covenant is long term, that there's generational fulfillment, and that if you are to be real men of God, you must think generationally. You must understand that what you are doing right now will affect your children and their children, and that the promises God made up the line to your father and grandfather and so on are promises that may be coming in your life or you may be a part of their fulfillment in your son's lives. Now, I understand some of you may not have had godly fathers. Well, fatherhood is not only biological, but it's also spiritual. And so I would encourage you, if that is your case, to consider the people that God has used in your life spiritually. Uh, consider uh, Pastor Andrew uh, and um, Pastor Michael and consider them as fathers. Consider the elders in your church as fathers. Consider the older godly men uh, who can influence you. Consider me a father uh, and understand that the fulfillment uh, to me uh, may come through you that the fulfillment of God's promises. Okay, now I'd like to go to the book of Exodus, and uh, I want to look at another covenant. And this is called the Mosaic Covenant, and it's in Exodus chapter 6. And uh, this, is, this is really interesting, and you'll notice that there are similarities to the Abrahamic Covenant. I'm going to read beginning at uh, the first verse in chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, just like then the Lord said to Abram, now it's the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he will let them go, that is Israel, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. Now notice the Lord is speaking to Moses about what the Lord is going to do, not just for Moses, but for Moses' people. So this idea of father and, and sons is, is carrying forth in this uh, covenant. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abram, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel. Okay, so before we look at what he said, what do we see so far? We see that God is the Lord and reveals himself, and that this revelation is not always complete. In fact, God continues to reveal himself. And we have the privilege of knowing of his prior revelations. But the works that he's doing in our lives and in your church and in the world, you know, will continue to reveal who he is as the Lord. Further notice that he's, he remembers his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob that when he made it to Abraham, he was really making it to Abraham's sons and, and grandsons as well. Um, and that, that they are in the land that he promised. But furthermore, he heard their groanings. Why is this? Because the Egyptians were cursing them. And as we found out in the Abrahamic covenant, 
I will curse those who curse you. And so God put 10 plagues on the Egyptians. God could have arranged it that they would have been sent out after the first plague, but God wanted them to have all 10 plagues because they had been a curse on Israel. And so again, I implore you, do not, do not harm with your mouth or with your actions God's people because God remembers his covenant. Anyway, so then this is, he says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, Moses is to say this to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. And you will notice that this, these verses begin with I am the Lord and end with I am the Lord. And there is another I am the Lord in the middle. This is a great proclamation. When, when the Lord God Almighty says, I am the Lord, He's saying his name. The word Lord is Yahweh. And he said that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know his name Yahweh, didn't know Lord or Jehovah, as we say, his personal name that he gave to Moses at the, uh, revealed to Moses at the burning bush. So he starts with his name. And in the middle, he says his name. And at the end, he repeats his name. God's name is very important. Your name is very important. And the promises you make are very important. You know, and they reveal your character when you keep them. And God keeps his promises and wants us to keep ours. So, he says, I am the Lord and... And then he gives seven I wills. Now, there were... There were several I wills in the Abrahamic covenant. Here's some more I wills. Um, This means this is what God is doing. This is a covenant in which God is promising to do this. I am the Lord and first, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord, your God. That's that middle one. Who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. And so he's fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. He's remembered the covenant. He's still working. You know, it's it's thousands of years after Abram. Abraham, and yet uh, he's doing this. This passage, uh, Exodus 6, uh, verses 6 through 8, are very important. In fact, um, the Jews use this particular section as their salvation. On Passover, which celebrate, which is at Easter, you know, it's when Jesus was crucified, they have a Passover meal and there are four cups of wine and the four cups of wine have for thousands of years represented the first four of these I wills. The first cup is, is called the sanctification cup. It's the separating, the bringing out. If you are in Christ, you have been sanctified. You have been brought out from among people. The second cup is the deliverance cup. I will deliver you from their bondage. So the second cup is not only have you been set apart, but you've been freed from the bondage to sin. You are now no longer bound to sin, but you have freedom in the spirit. We don't always exercise that freedom, but we have it because God has decreed it. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm. This is the redemption cup. This is the cup that Jesus took and said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. And then he said, I will not drink of it again. And he's referring to the fourth cup. And the fourth cup is, I will take you for my people and I will be your God. This is the second coming. And he said, I won't drink of it until I come in my my glory. Uh, to take you. 
And so, uh, so this, this covenant uh, really is the same as the Abrahamic covenant, but it gives us more detail about salvation and what we're doing. So, um, so Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they didn't, did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. Isn't that interesting? These people are crushed in in uh, Egypt. They're slaves, and they can't hear this. They don't. They choose not to listen. They don't perceive because of the suffering that they're in. Okay. So, what are some lessons from this passage? First, God remembers and keeps His promises. So, trust Him. Exercise faith in the Lord and in His covenant and not in your circumstances. You, like the Egyptians, may be despondent. God understands that, and it does not change his promises or their fulfillment. Second, think, pray, and act generationally just like your Heavenly Father. Think, pray, and act generationally. Um... Two of my sons are sitting here. Um, I prayed for them before I married their mother. I prayed for their mother for years before I met her. Pray for your sons and your daughters, even those that are not born yet. Thank God for your fathers and grandfathers, you know, both, both actual ones and spiritual ones. And and think, pray, and act generationally. Look at younger people in your church. Be godly men to younger people in your church. Tell them of the covenant that God has made based on his name. Um, and um, that honors God and pleases him. And be a blessing to God's people. And then the third lesson, I think, is remember and keep your promises. Uh, when you promise, remember, and then keep it. Okay, the last, uh, the last passage, the last section that we want to look at tonight is um, a further working out of this covenant, and it's the, uh, it's been called the Old Covenant. It's the Ten Commandments, which are found uh, both in uh, Exodus and in Deuteronomy. I'm going to read uh, from Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is because this was given at Sinai after the tenth plague, and they, they'd left Egypt, gone through the Red Sea. He drowned Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, but they walked through on dry ground. He brought them to Mount Sinai, and in Mount Sinai, uh, he revealed to Moses these commandments, and they were written on stone by God, and Moses brought them down to the people. And so this is God speaking these words. I am the Lord your God. Notice he says his name just like in the other two covenants. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's now history. You shall have no other gods before me. So he starts saying who he is, and then he begins to command. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is a jealous God. He is God Almighty, but he is jealous. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So what does it mean that God is jealous? It means that he visits iniquity of fathers on their children. 
this is a fearful thing for every father. Those of us who are fathers will know, like me, that you see your own sin being reproduced in the lives of your son. And you, you wonder at this, and you say, well... You know, and who can be, who can not pass this on to their their sons? I myself have sin from my father and my grandfather in my life. Uh, sin is generational, the same way righteousness is. And so, as as I've already said, we want to live generationally because that's the way God looks at things and looks at His promises and their fulfillment. Um, but we also want to understand this side, that it's not just cursing others who are a curse to God's people, but it actually works through from father to son to grandson as well. Okay, then in verse 7, he says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. God's honor is paramount. His name is important. And we carry his name if we are his children. We are adopted as sons, and that means that our name and God's name, we can dishonor God's name by dishonoring our own name, but we are, in this case, on our lips not to be speaking of this. And then the next commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy." So remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Godly men are Sabbath keepers. Now this is not a work. We don't want to confuse faith and work. But it is pleasing to God that we do this. You should be known by your faithfulness on the Sabbath. This should be your reputation. You should... You should do all you can. And it's hard in a secular culture where many companies are working on Sunday. And if we're going to have a job in those companies, people are have this conflict that we're going to work on Sunday or we're not going to work on Sunday. And I, godly men try to get in situations where they don't have to work on Sunday, where they can be a part of a church fellowship and worship God on the Sabbath. Um, remembering the Sabbath is begins there, but it's actually more than that. It's keeping it holy. It's um, ceasing. It's a day that is not to be like other days. It's not just another day off but it's, in fact, the Lord's day. Okay, the next is one of the most important for our consideration. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, that where the Ten Commandments are repeated by Moses, this was at Sinai, Deuteronomy is... Uh, just before they enter the land, just across uh, the Jordan River from Jericho, uh, where Moses repeats to the children the commandments of the Lord that he had given to their parents when they began their wilderness wandering. Anyway, in, in that version, in Deuteronomy 5, there's an addition. This is how it reads in Deuteronomy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Okay, please notice. New Testament says this is the first commandment with a promise. There is 
a result of this commandment. It is not for the benefit of the father and mother. It is for the benefit of the son and daughter. That it may go well with you. That, you, that your days may be prolonged. We talked last week a little bit uh, at the end about the fact that I'm working with this opiate addiction um, epidemic in our country. And I have to tell you that one of the things that is very common among these uh, young men who are addicted um, is that they are not honoring their father. And in many cases, they're they're committing the sins of their fathers uh, that we've already seen where the sins are visited to the sons and the grandsons to the third and fourth generation but uh, today there is so much dishonor for parents there is so people are thinking about themselves and they're thinking they hate their fathers and mothers or they won't have anything to do with them they don't uh, they don't take uh, their father or their mother into account in, in the way they speak and the, the actions they take. And I challenge you that one of the most important things really in this whole course, in this whole year, is this idea of the covenants, honor, blessing, service, understanding who God is because you see by honoring father and mother you're honoring God and the church from from the days of the uh, apostles the reformation throughout the throughout the age of the church this has been understood to mean not only biological father and mother but to all authorities that God uh, puts us under um, Doug Wilson has recently wrote a, uh, a blog in which he said that um, he was defending loving country as loving fathers. That uh, not that we should worship the country or to think of our country uh, in an idolatrous way, but that an extension of this fifth commandment uh, is the uh, should extend even to the love of country and certainly to the, uh, the in, injunction that we are not to speak ill of our leaders and to pray for them. Um, and this certainly extends to your pastors and to your elders and to um, your parents and grandparents. Uh, this, is, this is God's economy. He is generational and he expects subsequent generations to give honor to previous uh, generations. So then uh, he goes on and he says, um, this is the Lord, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. These are all the knots uh, of the Ten Commandments and uh, we might sum them up by saying, do no harm to others. So we have, in the beginning, the first four commandments are about God and honoring God. Then the fifth is honoring fathers and mothers. And then the subsequent one, ones have to do with honoring our neighbors. And so uh, the law is summed by Jesus that we love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. And so we can say that the first table of the law is about loving God. And the second table, the second five commandments are about loving our neighbors. In your handout, you'll see a little drawing I've made at the very end of the Ten Commandments. And you'll see this uh, sort of mapped out. And uh, in, in the Hebrew, the word for not is, uh, uh, would be pronounced lo. Um, 
and so the 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 second table, each one of them, has low murder, low adultery, low steal, low slander, low covet. And if we look at those, the the first three, that is commandments six, seven, and eight, are do not do certain deeds or acts. Don't murder. That's an action. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. And then the the fourth, don't slander. That's word. And then don't covet. That's thought. So you can say we are to love our neighbor in thought, word, and deed. And the same is true concerning God. The first tab- tablet, have no other no other gods, don't worship and serve anything but God, you might say that's thought. Then don't take the name of the Lord in vain, that's word. And then remember the Sabbath and honor your parents, that would be with deeds. And so we're to love God and our neighbor with, with thought, word, and deeds. And this is the the essence of the covenant, and it's really the basis upon which all the details that were given about fatherhood, about being a husband, about serving in the church, uh, are, are all based on how we were created and these foundational covenants. So what are the lessons from the, um, that we have from uh, this evening? If we can sum this up, I would say, number one, love God. He's delivered you. He's taken you to be his own. He's redeemed you. Honor your parents that it may go well with you. I want to, st- I want to tell you a story about this. I had um, a good friend. Uh, he actually lived here with uh, Debbie and I uh, for a while when he was single. And he had a father who was in the church. Um, I I don't remember exactly, but he taught a Sunday school class or something like that. But then, even though he had uh, six or seven children, he committed adultery with a woman in the church and ran off with her. And for years, my friend was without a father, without the father being present. And they would try to contact this man and... Um, at times, he was living out of a camper, and I think he did like construction work. Um, and um, they would send, the family would send him at Christmas and his birthday, would send him gifts, and the gifts tended to be in the form of Christian literature calling him to repent. And uh, this friend was... Um, frustrated by this and he asked me you know what I thought because most of these things came back unopened returned to sender and uh, and I told him of the fifth commandment and I said what would your what would your father like you to do for his birthday he said oh that's easy I said well what and I was thinking it must be something evil And he said, well, he'd want me to give him some steak. Are you kidding me? He said, no, he likes steak. I said, if it were me, I would find the finest steak in America. And I'd send him a box full of them. And I I suggested Omaha steaks. So, So he did. And his father called him and thanked him. I told him, when you send him the steaks, just say this, Dad, I love you. Happy birthday. Well, what ensued was a relationship with his son. And this father came to my friend's wedding, and the night before the wedding, at the rehearsal dinner that I was privileged to be a part of, this man got up weeping, repenting and praising my friend for his love 
and the way God used it to bring him to, to the Lord. This is, this is, now might you have estrangement with one of your fathers, you don't expect you're just going to buy a box of steaks and everything's going to be okay. I, that's, that's not the application I mean by this. There was a lot of prayer and there was a lot of time that went into what I just told you. This went, this happened over years, not over minutes. And, uh, and yet it is still true. And, and the point is this son honoring his father was honoring God. And God is pleased when we seek to honor him. When we, when we speak well, when we speak to edify, when we do acts to edify, when we keep our thoughts pure and our thoughts honoring to those around us, we forgive their slights and their sins. You know, we're big men. You know, we have strong shoulders. We stand up erect and we take it. And we don't give it back in kind, but we give it back in love. And so honor parents that it may go well with you. And then practice humble repentance and obedience that your sons may be blessed. Uh, think of your sons and your grandsons, even those not born. Uh, fourth, don't harm anyone. Uh, we often get harmed. Don't harm anyone in thought, word, or deed. And um, the last thing I have to say is love and serve others, starting with your wife and your, and your uh, sons. This, uh, this is what I wanted us to consider this evening. I um, appreciate the time that we have together. I really look forward to next week. I want to say that we have really one more week of these foundational things. And then uh, we're going, uh, in two weeks, we'll start with uh, more specific material, uh, looking in Scripture at uh, both precepts, that is, uh, teachings, uh, and uh, uh, narratives that show us examples of what godliness in men uh, looks like. But next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, and I, we've used this um, here in Toledo for years as a way to help uh, men understand how to study and teach the Bible and how not to study and how not to teach the Bible. And we like to use the Good Samaritan because uh, it, uh, everyone thinks it means what it actually does not mean. Uh, these many sermons that are preached on the Good Samaritan are actually wrong-headed. And so we're going to look at how, what we think it ought to be saying about doing good deeds and what it actually is saying. Um, and so the foundation next week is really how to teach the Bible, how to preach the Bible. You know, and if there's one thing a man should do that women are now doing... <laughs> You know, women have replaced men, you know, teaching the scriptures and preaching all over America. And if we're going to be godly men, really foundationally, because everything we're going to do the rest of the year, we're going to be taking scripture apart. And so this how to study the Bible properly, uh, rightly dividing it, is a really foundational subject. And we'll use the Good Samaritan as the text to help us do that. I'll, I'll refer to other places as well. A uh, number of different things that I want to share with you, but uh, that'll be that. And then in two weeks, then we'll really start looking at uh, at what it means, uh, pictures of real godly uh, godliness in men. Thank you very much. Would uh, one of you close in prayer, please? Yeah, I'll pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for the clear teaching of your scripture, and we pray that you impress it upon our hearts. We will grow, grow to be men who love you, who honor our fathers, who honor the authorities in our lives, who show our children how to honor you first and foremost in all things. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank you.
The Basic Training Podcast is led by Dr. Robert Forney. This podcast is available for download on the Apple and Google Podcast apps. Also for streaming on the Basic Training YouTube channel. If you're interested in contacting us, please email basictrainingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.